Okay, let's um, let's begin while people are um, entering uh, entering the Zoom room. Um, warm welcome to everyone who's uh, tuning in for what is already the third conversation in our Transformer State series on digital government and human rights. Um, I should say at the start that this conversation will be recorded and made available afterwards on uh, both our YouTube channel and our webpage. Um, and as those of you who joined us uh, uh, for earlier conversations in this series uh, will know, um, the conversation series focuses on uh, specific case studies of digital government transformation uh, in countries around the world and its implications for the protection of human rights. Uh, with a specific emphasis on innovation in what often is referred to as the welfare state. And our aim with the series is to introduce a wider audience of human rights uh, students, uh, academics, practitioners, and others, other interested uh, audience uh, on the implications of digital government for the field of human rights. And each conversation then will look at the promises and benefits of specific digital innovations in government, what's driving these changes, uh, what these in innovations entail in practice, how it affects the power of uh, governments and changes their interaction with uh, individuals, and uh, ultimately what the risks and also the benefits potentially are from the perspective of human rights. Now, one other goal we have with this series is to stimulate the formation of what we call a community of practice of those interested in digital government and human rights. And through this conversation series, but also through regular blogs uh, by students and academics and activists on our webpage and the sharing of relevant um, reports and other materials on these topics, we hope to quite informally bring together a network of activists and academics um, uh, committed to ensuring that digital government uh, complies with universal human rights standards. Now, for each conversation in this series, uh, my co colleague Victoria Edelman and I We'll interview a human rights practitioner, uh, academic or other experts on a specific case study. And we'll aim to do that for about an hour, although sometimes that's been optimistic and we go uh, slightly over. Uh, and today we will discuss Australia's experimentation uh, with so-called cashless debit cards with our guest, Eve Vincent. And uh, this conversation will center around the paternalistic assumptions behind these pilots and how they've been experienced by um, those who've been affected in practice. But before we begin, uh, let me introduce my uh, colleague, Victoria Edelman, together with whom I, uh, I interview our guest for this series. Uh, Victoria is a research scholar uh, working with me on the Digital Welfare State and Human Rights Project at the Center for Human Rights and uh, Global Justice. Victoria, over to you. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Eve Vincent to you. Um, Eve Vincent is a senior lecturer in the Department of Anthropology at Macquarie University. I think you're on mute, Victoria. Sorry. Is that better? Can you hear me now? Yeah, better. Apologies, everyone. Hello, <laughs> I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Eve Vincent. Um, Eve Vincent is a senior lecturer in the Department of Anthropology at Macquarie University and previously taught at NYU Sydney. She is widely published in scholarly journals and has authored and co-edited a number of books, including Against Native Title, Conflict and Creativity in Outback Australia, and Unstable Relations, Indigenous People and Environmentalism in Contemporary Australia. Eve's recent research concerns two distinct Australian welfare reform measures, the cashless debit card, which we'll be discussing today, and a program called Parents Next. From 2017, Eve undertook ethnographic research on the lived experiences of indigenous and non-indigenous individuals subject to the first trial of the cashless debit card in the Seduna region of South Australia. Um, Eve, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're really thrilled to have you. To start us off, I wonder if you could introduce our audience to the cashless debit card. So what is it and what does it do? Yeah, thanks so much, Victoria. Um, and yeah, uh, thanks so much to everyone for joining me, um, joining us today. It's a very stormy Sydney morning. Um, I wanted to begin by saying um, I joined this conversation from Darug country uh, in Western Sydney. So I'm, uh, you know, here today on country long uh, looked after by Darug people, Darug custodians. Uh, okay, the cashless debit card. The cashless debit 
debit card is a Visa debit card. It is currently issued to Social Security um, recipients in four different geographically bound trial sites in Australia. And what the card does is it essentially sequesters or quarantines 80% of a fortnightly government social security payment. So 80% is held on the card and the card is blocked from the purchase of alcohol or gambling products. And then there's a remaining 20% of the social security payment and that's paid as per usual into the social security recipient's bank account uh, and it can be withdrawn as cash. Thanks so much for sort of giving us the, the, the basics of this, uh, of this system. We wanted to start the conversation by uh, exploring a bit why this um, cashless debit card uh, was designed in the first place and introduced in the first place. And we thought in order to tell that story, we should probably go back a bit in time uh, to 2007. Um, when a report was published um, on um, abuse, child abuse in uh, Australia's Northern Territory, um, affecting um, Indigenous children. Um, and Eve, you um, uh, might be able to sort of take us to that moment in time, the publication of the report in 2007, in what kind of context um, uh, a predecessor to the cashless debit card, the basics card was then introduced and what that entailed and especially um, sort of underlining uh, what the purported benefits were of income management and having this electronic card system uh, to pay welfare benefits on. Yeah, that's right. I think it is really important to uh, step back to events of 2007, very dramatic events. So the cashless debit card could be seen to intensify an experiment in income management, as you say, compulsory income management, in fact, uh, which began in 2007. So this involved the introduction of another card, uh, a card called the Basics Card, into Northern Territory Aboriginal communities. And then a little bit later, uh, the Basics Card was also introduced into four remote um, Queensland communities in the far north of Queensland. So into the north of Australia in, in both cases. And the basics card was introduced uh, as part of a kind of, um, you know, wide ranging and militarized intervention into the Northern Territory, into Northern Territory Aboriginal life at that time in 2007, following the release of a, a kind of shocking report um, into uh, child, uh, child sexual abuse in Indigenous communities. Uh, the intervention involved a huge suite of legislation um, surrounding, you know, a range of measures. So changing governance arrangements, changing land tenure, as well as uh, fundamentally changing the way social security was provided in these places. Um, in order to pass that intervention, sort of the, the, legis the package of legislation, uh, Australia's Racial Discrimination Act was suspended. So this is a 1975 Commonwealth Act. Uh, so very blatantly, very explicitly, uh, the basics card was racially discriminatory. It's racially targeted. Uh, this is the very kind of, you know, the dying days of, of a uh, neoconservative government in Australia. And towards the very end of 2007, there was a change of government. An incoming centre-left Labor government uh, was you know, sought to continue, very much sought to continue a lot of the intervention measures, but was very uncomfortable uh, with policy that necessitated the suspension of the Racial Discrimination Act. So uh, the Labor government sought to reinstate the act. Um, and in 2010, it moved to expand the application of basics cards onto non-Aboriginal people. Uh, however, you know, and it was expanded in 2012, expanded further still into kind of various disadvantaged uh, locations in Australia. Um, but it really remains the case, uh, you know, there's around 25,000 people on the basics card in the Northern Territory. There's around two and a half thousand people on the basics card across the whole of the rest of Australia, which is far more populous. So the basics card is a card used by Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory. There are differences between the basics card and the cashless debit card. Um, the first difference, the basics card is lime green. 
the cashless debit card is a silvery sort of metallic gray. I mean, that sounds sort of really superficial, but it speaks to the question of recognizability and social stigma in sort of everyday use of the card. Uh, however, I would say that the cashless debit card is still identifiable uh, when, when a user sort of hands it over. Um, it has the name of the financial product company that has been contracted to administer the card printed on it. So it says INJU at the top. Uh, the other, you know, really important difference is the percentage of social security payments that are quarantined. Uh, it does vary on the basics card, but generally it's a 50% split, 50% quarantine, 50% still available as cash. Um, and so that's why, you know, I say, and, and others would also say that the cashless debit card represents an intensification of, of this, you know, compulsory income management. They also use different technology, which is something I think we'll get to a bit later. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of you asking about, you know, the, the benefits, the justification, the rationale, I think the basics card was touted as a measure that would help end high rates of welfare dependency uh, in places that are geographically very, very far removed from traditional labour markets. So, you know, the basics card fits into a global discourse that, that will be very familiar to our listeners. It was an image of parasitic dependency. You know, this was represented as a very disempowering condition, which in turn fostered all kinds of social pathologies. Um, the basics card was meant to, you know, was envisaged as a kind of pathway out of welfare dependency into responsible and healthy personhood. So normalization was a very explicit goal of the intervention measures. Uh, so there was this idea that more closely controlling the way welfare recipients spend social security income, then this would translate into, you know, improve school attendance rates, foster healthy eating, you know, it would impact First Nations family life, family dynamics, address gender-based violence. So, you, you can see it carried this really heavy load, like in terms of the, the promises and, and the, the benefits that were imagined um, to flow from this. It promised to fix, I guess, a whole range of things. So it's beyond a more narrow aim to move people from welfare into work, which is, is what work fairs usually designed to do. Right. You, you described the um, cashless debit card trials as an intensification of the original income management uh, um, surrounding the basics card. Um, and could you take us to uh, the reasons for that transformation and intensification, uh, which as we understand it, uh, understand it happened after there was a review of income management by um, um, Forrest, uh, who, is a, who is a billionaire and um, a mining magnet who was asked by the government 2013 to uh, to review the original income management uh, trials. What in that report sort of led to the intensification of CDC, and um, has there been also a shift in, um, in in rationale behind the system at that time? And, and why is that? Why, why did the rationale shift from the original uh, after the the report on child sex abuse in 2007? Uh, yeah, again, I mean, in terms of tracing the, the genealogy of the cashless debit card, I think this is an important uh, moment, the 2013 Forest Review. So this was actually a government commissioned review of Indigenous employment policy. Um, and as you say, it was undertaken by a mining magnate, Andrew Forrest. Uh, Forrest is a very controversial figure in Australia. Uh, he is a philanthropist, a uh, very active philanthropist. Um, but he has also fought against the award of rights in land to Aboriginal people affected by some of his most profitable extractive ventures in, in Western Australia. And in that, as part of his review into um, employment, he proposed what he called a healthy welfare card, uh, a healthy welfare card which would deposit 100% or would, would allocate 100% of uh, social security payments onto a card. And that card would, again, be, you know, would essentially be blocked from operating where alcohol could be accessed or gambling. So it would, would essentially prohibit social security recipients from drinking and gambling. 
So then, I mean, I think it's a little bit hard to establish what happened between 2013 and 2015, a lot of um, sort of uh, sounding out of potential places where this could begin. Uh, this sort of happens, you know, quite quietly. Uh, a couple of trial sites uh, for, the, for this healthy welfare card were, were established. Um, and as part of the process of, of kind of figuring out how to implement these ideas, 100% uh, of welfare quarantine was deemed unworkable. Um, so you can imagine, you know, life without cash, like no cash at all in very remote places, limited digital infrastructure, very strong local barter economies, um, you know, secondhand market, secondhand goods, really important to, to local life. Uh, so that, there was that shift from 100% to 80%. And then legislation was passed in 2015. In early 2016, the card was introduced into to small and predominantly Indigenous places. So Sejuna, where I've done my research, and the East Kimberley. Mm -hmm. Um, so in those two places, um, anyone on and what gets called an income support payment, so anyone receiving a social security benefit who was age 65 and under was issued the card with one exception, which is people on veterans payments. So by design, it's a really broad application. So it's different to the basics card in that it is, you know, a, it putatively, is not race-based. Um, in reality, 75% of people in Sejuna on the card are Aboriginal, 80% of people on the card in the East Kimberley are Aboriginal. So critics of the card have long sort of argued that it is in fact race-based. And I think in that initial stage, that was a very hard argument for the government to contradict. Uh, in those two places, you know, initially I would say that the justification, you know, had much in common in a way with with the, the discourse surrounding the basics card, these places were represented as, as in crisis, uh, that, a, that a drastic measure was warranted. Uh, so by that, I mean, there was sort of this, you know, a whole genre of media articles appearing about uh, alcohol consumption, rates of assault, presentations to emergency. So, conjuring up a very negative picture of local life, um, you know, recitation of statistics, some statistics, you know, I saw appear in, you know, very consistently, some very poignant interviews with, with um, local figures in these places. So, uh, you know, I think it's important to appreciate that this kind of fits with a kind of public imaginary, very much sort of, you know, images that circulated throughout the intervention of Aboriginal poverty, extreme circumstances, these places get described as dysfunctional in Australian public discourse. So, you know, you get this picture of an extreme place and so a kind of extreme solution is proffered. Um, and former uh, Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull described the cashless debit card as an exercise in tough love. So the idea was very much, you know, you're not looking after yourselves. We need to step in and take better care of you. So this is, you know, very much framed in terms of um, a, a care, you know, a, a kind of disciplinary but caring measure. And the initial mm -hmm. legislation, there's a preamble which talked about addressing social harms, that the car would prevent social harms from taking place. But having set up the card, having rolled out the technology, a, a sort of broader um, policy objective has emerged and, and more, more and more non-Aboriginal people are now on the card since those two other geographical trial sites have been added. We, we've seen in recent months, I think, or at least in 2020, um, that there's also been talk about broadening the pilots even further and maybe rolling them out um, nationwide in Australia. Um, and at the same time, the responsible um, minister has also talked about the benefits of a cashless debit card to uh, empower individuals on benefits, for instance, by making it easier to budget, um, um, to increase financial literacy and, and, and objectives like, uh, like that. But what do you see as the um, uh, sort of the next step in, uh, in, in these trials? Do you expect that there will be a nationwide rollout and will that then affect um, uh, the reasons mentioned for having um, for having cashless debit cards, for instance, underlying underlining less uh, sort of the the state of emergency 
uh, that is perceived in certain areas of, uh, of, of Australia where you have high indigenous populations and um, uh, focusing more on those sort of empowering functions of the, of the card. And also, to what extent do you think that the, um, the basic features uh, or, or, or the basic sort of conditions under which you can uh, use the card will change as a result, for instance, by quarantining less of, uh, of the benefits received um, by making it easier to access the trial, et cetera? Yeah, so there is legislation before Parliament at, at the very moment um, to try, that's legislation that does two things. It, it transitions everyone who remains on the, those basics cards introduced sort of, you know, more than a decade ago now, transition them from the basics card to the cashless debit card, um, which, you know, shifts them onto a different technology. Um, and the legislation would also remove the status of trial from the four existing geographic trial sites. Uh, so there's always been a lot of cynicism uh, about the idea of trial mm -hmm. among my research participants. Um, you know, so successive evaluations of this policy have been either inconclusive or, you know, quite have, or have found no measurable benefits. And yet, um, it, it, you know, the, the trial keeps being extended and now looks set to be made permanent. This, that's probably, this legislation is probably the first step in further expansion. Uh, although there's no concrete plans in place at the moment. Another kind of signal that, you know, further expansion is is a, there's a vision for further expansion is that um, Australia's biggest four banks, as well as Australia Post, uh, are in conversation with the federal government about taking over the contract uh, to kind of manage the cards, which presumably is partly to do with uh, trying to bring down the cost of, of the card. Um, I think, you know, it's worth kind of pointing out that uh, yeah, so there's those first two initial trial sites, very Indigenous places, then moves to a third trial site, which is also in a fairly kind of far-flung locality. It was kind of half-half Indigenous, non-Indigenous. And then the fourth trial site is uh, in Queensland. That's much more recent, began in early 2019. Um, but Queensland, you know, it's in sort of a far more well-known and populous part of Australia. And when, when the cashless debit card was rolled out to this trial site, uh, it was issued to social security um, recipients who were 35 and under. So quite a different mm. criteria. And I think that speaks, that more selective criteria speaks to the fact that it is more politically difficult to impose the cashless debit card on sort of more mainstream Australians. Um, but yes, as part of that shift to, I guess, more you know, more mainstream places. And, and we really saw a shift mm -hmm. uh, in the discourse and justification when it moved to Queensland. Uh, some of those issues that you raised around digital literacy, uh, budgeting tools, much more discussion of youth unemployment, uh, intergenerational welfare dependencies. So less kind of, you know, less that, that sense of uh, care, still the theme of responsibility, but I guess in, in a less kind of dramatic register. Before we um, before we move sort of towards your um, your research in Seduna and uh, and also some of the problems that have emerged around the use of the use of the card, just to very briefly come back to what you just said about um, uh, Australian Post or um, or banks stepping in and taking over from the private operator in view that has um, has operated the card and the and the system behind it uh, until now. I was wondering if you have any insight into uh, the cost of uh, the project so far, uh, because that clearly is an issue, uh, administrative expenditure here. And also just to note that there's an interesting parallel between South Africa and Australia, where uh, social grants uh, were paid via a private provider for a while. Uh, and there was a lot of controversy around that, including in terms of the cost and, uh, and, and financial exploitation. In, um, in which case, at the end, um, um, a public provider stepped in as well. It's sort mm -hmm. of interesting to see that uh, to see that parallel happening here as well. But that's a, a, just an aside. So, if you could briefly um, a comment on, on on the cost of um, of the CDC trials, and then we'll we'll get more to the specifics of your uh, of your research. So, yeah, very consistently, the estimate is that it costs around 10,000 per participant per year. 
to administer um, being on the card. Um, yeah, and wow. absolutely, yeah. <laughs> That's significant. It is, and I, I mean, I think uh, among the people I do research with, it's well known and discussed and critiqued. I mean, it's seen as morally objectionable that uh, that there is profit, you know, profit making, uh, you know, at, you know, on the on the basis of their poverty, and that people do have, uh, you know, quite a strong analysis of the the kind of generation of private profits and the expense involved, you know, the outlay in order to constrain the spending of their very meager incomes. Yeah, absolutely. So just to, just to build on those comments about the role of uh, Indu, um, just to kind of comment on the fact that activist Neola Niorkas has written about um, the experience of having to interact with Indu um, mm -hmm. in, in trying to, if she ever has to make a payment that's slightly larger, um, and needs to withdraw some of that quarantined income as cash, she's written that she has to go begging Daddy Indu for permission to use funds. Um, so I wonder if you could comment a little bit on how the fact that the CDC is run by this private company, um, how that actually affects the experiences of people on the card in practice? Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, so Australia has this very privatised social security system. There's a period of, you know, rapid, extensive outsourcing of employment services in the late 1990s. The cashless debit cards absolutely consistent with this pattern. Uh, private interests being involved in the provision of welfare state support. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I would say that a lot of people I work with um, you know, do kind of talk about dealing with injury uh, in, you know, relatively benign or even positive terms that they find that the staff on the injury helpline are responsive to their requests. So they have to ring, you know, at so various, very, various sort of variations to, to the conditions. So having to pay into a landlord's, you know, if there's a private rental arrangement uh, need to be cleared by injury. Um, but most of the people I talked to have found um, the, you know, people that answer the injury phones are, you know, pleasant to deal with and quite efficient. Uh, that could be that they are also kind of drawing a contrast with the very long wait times associated with actually calling the government social security service in Australia, which is called Centrelink. Centrelink in turn has outsourced its call centres. And this is currently a very controversial issue in Australia. Uh, you know, this, this, you know, having to sit on the phone to talk to what is ostensibly a government service, but that, you know, the call centres have been outsourced. I, I would say that, um, you know, not to discount Neola's experience, but, but mostly, um, you know, among the people I worked with, it was more at the level of principle that, that people mm -hmm. kind of objected to, you know, um, the, the privatisation, the, this profiting of poor people, you know, a sense, you know, a lot of people are like, what I would do with $10,000, you know, I mean, uh, it, people really, uh, you, you know, Australia's kind of social security rates, rates, especially the unemployment rate has eroded, you know, very um, badly over the last 25 years. Uh, the rate of payment is, is very low. Uh, so it's, galling uh, to people that private interests could be, um, yeah, could be so involved. You know, I would also say that, you know, on a more theoretical level, I think it does raise the question of, uh, you know, dependency and, and it sort of cast doubt on this image of dependency when actually we see there are all kinds of interdependencies at work here. And I think people do have an intuitive sense of that, like there are companies, there are jobs, there are all these, you know, systems in place in which others are quite dependent on, for their livelihoods, on managing the everyday lives of social security recipients. So I think it, it does raise kind of crucial questions about, uh, you know, various interdependencies that exist between the state, private interests and uh, people who are represented as being as only kind of 
you know, taking from this state. Mm -hmm. And just just to go further on on what you found in your in your research specifically as to the tangible and practical experiences of people um, on this card, I want to kind of look specifically at the technology that's being used here and what the impact of this um, technology is. So as with so many digital government initiatives, the CDC builds on the previous basics card initiative. Um, but there are some, some technological changes. So um, while the older technology blocked purchases from a specific shop or merchant, um, the newer technology will block specific products. Um, and you mentioned the limited digital infrastructure and secondhand markets um, earlier on in the conversation. I wonder if you could talk a little bit to these sort of technological failures and, and, and what people have to experience in practice here. Yeah, sure. So uh, as you point out, the basics card involves, you know, certain stores having the capacity either to accept the card or not. Um, and, you know, from my reading around the introduction of the basics card that resulted in kind of very prominent signage, you know, basics card accepted here, uh, basics card not accepted here. So it was a kind mm -hmm. of sorting of consumers or citizens, um, you know, a kind of segregating of, of where people could go. The cashless debit card, um, so, so one of the reasons to move people from the basics card to the cashless debit card as per this new legislation is to, because it's a different technology, um, which uh, in theory means it works wherever there's an FPOS terminal, except in shops where the merchant codes within the FPOS system indicate that alcohol and gambling products are being sold. So FPOS, uh, this refers to these are really ubiquitous kind of machines, uh, you know, like small little uh, contraptions in Australia. Um, FPOS refers to electronic funds transfer at point of sale. So that's either tapping uh, using the chip, uh, swiping using the stripe on the card and, and then entering a pin number. So the card is integrated with the FPOS system and FPOS uh, terminals are, are, are really widely available. Uh, as, as you go to check out of stores in Australia. Um, because of that integration, it means when people move out of a geographic trial area, they stay on the card because in theory that it's moving somewhere where there, there will still be FPOS. So the card still works. Um, now, yeah, I have emphasized, you know, in theory everywhere there's FPOS provided alcohol and gambling not for sale because yeah, absolutely some of my research participants uh, describe inconsistencies. Um, you know, describe feeling very trepidatious, in fact, about heading down the main street with their car because it was proving unreliable. Um, this mm -hmm. was relatively new technology at the time I was doing my research. So, yeah, people were finding that the card would be quite randomly declined, like declined somewhere today, even though it worked yesterday. Um, some people just found that annoying, focused on it as an inconvenience. But I definitely spoke with people where the practical problem be, sort of became a larger kind of psychosocial problem, um, you know, and they described the moment the card fails and having to gather their shopping, return it to the shelves, people behind them in the supermarket queue, that, that sort of sense of, of, a, of a judging gaze um, maybe people they know, because this is these are small communities, an acute sense of shame and humiliation. Um, yeah, I mean, more recent research, which appeared last year, suggests that these technological problems uh, have largely been resolved, um, which is good, but also speaks to the issue of you know who, who gets to be an experimental population and experience that early phase of, of the technology. If I may briefly follow up, um, Eve, one of the other things that you uh, mentioned in your report was that some of the people that you uh, have spoken with at length uh, mentioned that people, when they go into a store, they sometimes don't know how much um, is left on their, mm -hmm. on their card. And that seems to be partly related to difficulties with checking their balance. Um, which might be related to the fact that in certain areas, internet connectivity, for instance, is spotty or people just don't have a smartphone or other way of, of, of checking their balance and sort of the issues that come up with not knowing and in, going into a store, whether you're actually able to, uh, to, to pay for groceries, for instance. Could you describe, like, do you need to um, log into a portal if you want to check your balance? Uh, how do you sort of manage your account? 
Yeah, so you can log into either an app or, you know, online. Um, when I was doing my field work, you know, I worked in sort of places like public computers came under a lot of pressure for people to come in and check their balance, particularly. Uh, so computers in libraries and community centres, etc. I mean, that raises questions about security because people are using public computers to enter personal details and uh, passwords. Uh, one of the other reasons that people are, you know, often log in is to, you know, continue to share resources in the way that um, resources are shared in these communities. Uh, so it is possible to transfer funds from one cashless debit card account into another. So you can't transfer into an account. You can't convert. Um, you can't easily convert. There, there are ways of um, subverting the policy, but you can't um, simply transfer it into a bank account and convert it into cash. But you can transfer what, what my research participants refer to as Inju to Inju. So uh, yeah, a lot of people seeking to kind of get on a public computer in order to kind of move um, money around um, and, 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 and kind of share funds. Um, yeah, so digital infrastructure is an issue, security is an issue. Having said that, some people I know would also, I guess, be very quick to point out that it, it's not like, uh, you know, some people are incredibly computer savvy. I wouldn't want to perpetuate an image that, that somehow, uh, you know, traditional Aboriginal people are, are not computer savvy. I mean, there's, there's some really great research coming out of Macquarie Uni where I work. Uh, Bronwyn Carlson has worked a lot on, you know, the huge uptake of social media among Aboriginal communities, including very remote communities, a very kind of creative and intensive um, use of social media to connect with kin, etc. So it does vary a lot in terms of people's confidence in, in dealing with um, the kind of, on, you know, online management of their Inju accounts. Mm -hmm. Um, I just want to go back to the sort of this idea of the the promises of the benefits of the card again, and we've sort of mentioned um, alcoholism and gambling as being brought as early justifications. Um, and you've talked about the new paternalist thinking, um, which underlies the cashless debit card, and activists have also highlighted how punitive it is and the harmful stereotypes um, that the scheme is based on. Um, but we've also talked about the financial literacy element in terms of using this as a tool. So I wonder if you could speak to some of the stereotypes and assumptions um, which are embedded into the into the scheme, um, but also whether any of these promises of empowering people um, to sort of take control of their finances, for example, have um, actually worked in, in practice for anyone at all. Sure. Um, so there's sort of two parts to that. Uh, you know, the new, mater new paternalism, um, yeah, I'm referencing there, of course, the thinking of Lawrence Mead. Um, Mead was very active in debates about welfare reform in the US, the mid 1990s Clinton reforms, you know, advocating for more supervisory relationships to the poor, um, had this very strong focus on individual behaviour policy designed to foster individual responsibility. And Mead was really taken up among Australian uh, kind of, you know, he was influential within Australian policy circles in the 1990s. Um, and his thinking kind of dovetails with some, uh, you know, very powerful writing at the time uh, from an Indigenous public intellectual who was, it was grappling with, uh, you know, social conditions in, in places uh, which, in his opinion, this is Noel Pearson, in his opinion, had declined since the era of equal rights. So, you know, the legacy of, of, of this, these sorts of debates is this focus on the individual at the expense of a historical perspective, a broader social perspective, which, you know, I would argue are absolutely necessary to understanding how things came to be the way they are. In, in terms of stereotypes and assumptions, you know, one of the stereotypes that's circulated really consistently um, throughout this debate about welfare and contemporary Indigenous life is a very negative image of Aboriginal family life, an image of an oppressive male here who monopolises cash, um, which results in sort of compromised caregiving on the part of the, the mother figure. You know, this is a very sensitive area. Um, I'm coming at this, you know, as a non-Indigenous researcher. But yeah, I mean, there's this pathologizing of 
the Aboriginal family, a stereotype that's consistent across the intervention and into the cashless debit card. Um, and, and these are images of irresponsibility, of, of compromised caregiving. They're, they're deeply offensive to people, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whose lives are challenging, but there, there's a huge emphasis on looking after kin and of caring mm -hmm. for others within these communities. Um, there's also, you know, there's also the sort of image of irresponsibility and then the state stepping in to kind of foster responsibility is very infantilizing. And it's a very consistent theme in my interviews is how uh, sort of infantilizing uh, people experience this. Mm -hmm. But in terms of your second sort of question, Victoria, do, you know, do any of these um, promises or purported benefits uh, ring true? Yeah, absolutely. I, I definitely worked with people who felt that uh, the cashless debit card had, you know, curb spending in some ways and had made it easier to get through the fortnight, like the fortnightly cycle, um, you know, was something people described as, as kind of having a, a sort of a good week and a hard week and that actually the cashless debit card had um, kind of helped with budgeting. Some people really like the Inju app um, mm -hmm. and have found that an effective budgeting tool. So, you know, I'd say there's, there's a great diversity of opinions and experiences on the ground. Thanks, to, thanks so much. Um, I wanted to move uh, the conversation towards um, uh, your methodology for, uh, for a moment, Eve. Uh, you've sort of touched upon that indirectly, but I wanted to go that, to that explicitly. Um, and just to say to our audience members, um, we're soon to move to Q&A with, with Eve. So if you have any questions at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A function. Uh, where you can type in any questions you might uh, you might have for her, but so on uh, on method Eve in, in the report that you wrote last year on your research you uh, underline the importance and I quote of listening to those people affected by this controversial experiment in conditional welfare delivery, and um, so this whole foregrounding uh, in your work of lived experience. Um, is obviously um, sort of overlapping with a human rights approach to, um, uh, to research. Uh, that's also very relevant for the work that we've been doing here at, um, at the center. I wonder if you could talk briefly uh, about the role of your research and uh, storytelling in, in, in relation to CDC, um, also how it relates to the fact, which is a broader concern that a lot of uh, people on the card feel they're not being listened to, they haven't been consulted about uh, about any of uh, of these uh, of these pilots uh, and and relatedly if you could talk a little bit about sort of if you will the added value of your research method sort of what does it bring uh, in addition to other forms of uh, of, of research that are uh, that are out there yeah sure I mean I guess when I I, I have a kind of longer sort of connection to this place uh, to Sejuna um, and I guess when I started doing this research, it was very important to me to distinguish myself or to make a distinction between what I was doing and the task of evaluation. Um, so I wanted to make clear that I was not there, you know, that, that I was not thinking about this question in the same terms as the state was thinking about it. I felt that that already kind of built in so many assumptions about these lives as problems that, that I was not comfortable with. And so, you know, I really, you know, tried to very explicitly say to people, I'm not here to decide if it works or doesn't work. I, I'm really here, you know, I was there with a really fundamentally anthropological sort of question, which is, you know, tell me about your lives. Um, and, and there was a second part to that, not just to kind of um, make a distinction between the task of evaluation and, and the task of Kind of listening uh, but to also kind of uh, you know I guess it's a bit of an academic way to frame it but to denaturalize the category of welfare recipient so I sought not to define people by you know you know in the same terms that the social security system defines them which is you know by definition the, the, it, it you know it, it takes it foregrounds this one thing which is waged work and says, right now you're not doing wage work, therefore you are unemployed. Uh, so I sought to kind of meet people and grasp people's kind of lives and, and meaning in a much fuller sense to understand that there were, you know, lots of things that people did do 
even if they weren't doing waged work. And of course, one of the things that people do do is unpaid care work. Uh, so either care for children, uh, care for, you know, ailing or elderly kin. Um, so I very much wanted to kind of recognise that kind of care labour. Um, and yeah, in terms of uh, not evaluating and instead listening, I wanted to, you know, give voice to a grassroots experience. And you're right that one of the motivations for people to, um, to have those conversations with me, to share with me, is that they had felt not listened to in terms of the process of the card's introduction and to its, you know, the transition from it being a trial, the trial has been extended, you know, a number of times now. And, and in each, each, each time that happens, the process seems, uh, you know, very hard to grasp from the perspective of those living with the card. Uh, so I guess, Talking to me uh, did represent an opportunity to kind of, uh, you know, have a say and, and people, I think, generally, th there were sort of two things that people wanted me to do with their words. Uh, you know, some people wanted me to kind of take their stories and tell this story more broadly. Uh, so a sense of, you know, reaching a wider audience. But some people saw me as having... Uh, the capacity to affect policy and they wanted to make sure that I took their story and fed it back into, I guess, you know, government processes surrounding uh, policy making. So it's interesting that you sort of become an alternative outlet for policy grievances, even though your explicit objective is very different, obviously. Uh, just one more question before we get to the Q&A, um, um, because we're already at um, 5.45 and I'm sure people on this side of the of the ocean would like to go to dinner at some point and uh, and, and people in Australia go on with the rest of their days um, uh, at, at, at some point after this conversation but I just wanted to briefly in, um, address the role of human rights in uh, in your work um, we um, have a late colleague here at the, um, uh, used to have a, a colleague here at the, at the center uh, who's unfortunately passed away Sally Engel Mary and uh, she was an anthropologist that's written about the process of what she called vernacularization of, of human rights. Uh, this process by which, and I quote, uh, the extraction of ideas and practices from the universal sphere of international organizations uh, is then translated into ideas and practices that resonate with the values of doing things in a local context. Um, I'm wondering, first of all, did people uh, bring up human rights at all as a concept in conversations with you in your research? And uh, secondly, I'm just curious to know what kind of vernacularization actually took place, if, if any. Uh, was there any sort of adaptation of that global uh, legal human rights language into uh, uh, practices in, uh, in Sedona? Um, yeah, this is a great question. I mean, I, I think you've uh, given me some new terms for which to think about um, certain things happening in Sedona. Definitely a vernacularization of the discourse of human rights. That, that's in evidence. Um, there was a protest held on the main street of Sedona very early on in the trial. And, uh, you know, one sort of hand painted sign simply read human rights. Um, people, you know, picked up that discourse and, and it really spoke to this, the situation. Uh, they're taking away our rights. That's something people often said to me. So both Indigenous and non-Indigenous people uh, spoke a language of, of rights. Um, there's an exemption process uh, and it in, involves people providing access to, you know, a range of data held about them. And people talk about individual rights to privacy and objecting to that exemption process. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of an adaptation to the Australian context, um, so not just transposing it, but, but kind of um, actually adapting it. I think, you know, this does raise a, a very complicated question to do with settler colonialism, indigenous rights to land, collective rights, and I guess the limitations of uh, individualized human rights discourse. Um, so, you know, that meant that there's a lot to kind of discuss there. I, maybe I'll just close by saying, um, you know, that, that people kind of, uh, you know, Indigenous interviewees would, would sketch a kind of 
uh, you know, uh, provide me with a kind of historical story that there was, you know, a time before rice in which, uh, you know, Aboriginal people's access to money was very tightly controlled. This is a long and complex history, but it involves lots of sequestering, but also stealing of both wages and welfare entitlements. And this, this happened in a time before citizen rights. Um, and then the Aboriginal political movement secures equal citizen rights in a legislative sense. And then, you know, decades later, we have the cashless debit card and Aboriginal people would sort of present this to me as an anachronistic measure, uh, that it was reminiscent of rations, but somehow the government had failed to understood that this is a time after rights. And so it was an unacceptable, um, it, it, it could not, you know, kind of uh, treat Aboriginal people um, like this in the present in a way that it had been able to get away with treating them in the past. Then we have rights now, you can no longer do that. Yeah, um, we're getting educated now. Like, so a, a kind of marker between, you know, back then uh, they did this to us and they could, but they're doing it to us again. And, you know, this time, you know, they shouldn't be able to. Um, a, this is a time of rights. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Thanks. Thanks very much. And now to go to um, some of the questions that have come in from the audience. And um, we still have a little bit of time if anyone has any further questions. Um, I want to first go to a question that kind of delves back into this idea of whether the promises are being, um, you know, met. <laughs> uh, so one person has asked, has the rate of alcoholism and gambling decreased since the introduction of the cashless debit card, but has such a survey been conducted at all? Well, actually, it's, uh, some really, um, you know, very new research has just come out. This is um, independent academic research. Uh, yeah. that there is, I'll rewind and say that the government, of course, commissioned a large scale evaluation. Uh, it was really widely criticised for its methodology, which was sort of self-reported behaviour change. So asking people, do you drink less now? Uh, and the the and again, this was you know a private contract. It was a tender process. The researchers did not have access to a very good baseline data, and so it, you know it was a very inconclusive and and you know I think uh, fair to say shonky uh, evaluation, which was criticised by the National Audit Office um, mm -hmm. for, for for just you know. It, Basically, the National Audit Office said this is this does not help us tell whether or not this works. It, it does not help at all. In response to that, the government um, commissioned another evaluation process, this time involving university researchers, and that has not been publicly released yet. So, I mean, that will be a, a kind of interesting moment. In the meantime, however, there have been a, a small group of researchers working at, um, well, the lead researcher is at Monash University. Mm -hmm. um, Luke Greenacre is his name. And, and what those researchers did is compare gambling data, um, emergency presentation data, um, arrests under the Public Intoxication Act data, and they found no appreciable difference between mm -hmm. pre, prior to the introduction of the card post introduction to the card. Now, obviously, uh, you know, they, they acknowledge um, that there are limitations to, you know, arrests under the Public Intoxication Act is, is not equal mm -hmm. drinking. It, it equals, you know, the rates at which excessive drinking, public drinking is being policed. They mm -hmm. are two different measures. But certainly um, that was, a, a, you know, revelatory research, I think, uh, in, in terms of um, not actually you know, the, the promises do not appear to be substantiated according mm -hmm. to that research. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. And we've had a few questions as well that relate specifically to the technology. Um, so um, one person is wondering if you could provide more insight into how it, the technology works in sorting between what can be purchased on the card and what can't. So you talked about the FPOS um, terminals, but um, 
how would the technology sort between a bottle of rice wine, for example, which is used in Chinese cooking, and a bottle of beer? Is this uh, does this happen at the level of the of the shop or the shopkeeper that's coding in the item, or is there a pre-programmed algorithm? Um, and there's a sort of follow-up question to this as well as to whether the card creates a record of shops visited and items mm -hmm. bought that provide the government with um, intimate and private information about people's lives and activities and habits uh, and, and whether that information, like what the government can do with that information. Yeah, okay, so to go to the first, it's, um, it's kind of complicated because it is, it is about the merchant codes, it is about codes uh, associated with certain products that indicate their alcohol products or gambling products. But if a merchant um, you know, uh, is able to sell those products, then they're, they're, they are blocked from being able to use the card. There are places, of course, say the local pub, where there's a bistro section and a, an alcohol section, and they can work with the government to have an arrangement whereby you you know it's it's more at, it's more discretionary and that you know at, at the level of sales you can put them through your food but not your drink but mostly it's that uh, shops where alcohol and gambling is available and that's indicated um, through you know the, the product codes that are connected to the merchant then then the card doesn't work there. Um, what was the second part of the question? Regarding the, the record of, of purchases, shops right. visited, habits. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, there are researchers who've gone through the sales data in order to try and answer the question, you know, another question relating to benefits to try and ascertain whether or not um, the spending is, you know, is sort of weighted towards healthy foods or discretionary foods. So the fact that that research can be undertaken, so mm -hmm. they've accessed that data through freedom of information requests, presumably, um, the fact that they can access that information indicates that, yes, that information is being uh, collected. So, I mean, very occasionally activists and, and academics raise the prospect of data mining, but um, I, it hasn't been you know, there's so many kind of concerns to do with stigmatization. Um, yeah, there, there are other human rights, etc. There are other concerns that have been much more kind of prominent in the debate around the card. Mm -hmm. And um, just on another um, kind of more technological um, <laughs> aspect here is um, regarding the, the justification of the original basics card. Um, which was also to cut down on humbugging or, or demand sharing. Um, and this has been imported into the CDC because the quarantining of income makes it more difficult to transfer over uh, resources. Um, and there was a, an explicit um, recommendation that we should cut down on card swapping. So the, so the Minduru Foundation had recommended increased surveillance of CDC users. Um, so whether has that recommendation been carried out and do you see the CDC as being used to punish or prevent that kind of sharing? Yeah, so um, the Mindaroo Foundation is Andrew Forrest's philanthropic, um, sort of the wing of his um, uh, you know, sort of business ventures. Um, yeah, so I mean, this is why I centred the question, I guess, of Aboriginal family life. I think this is an intervention into um, a, a kind of Indigenous sociality. Um, it's always been seen as a major concern that um, the sharing of resources could, uh, you know, which is an established feature of a, a kind of egalitarian, you know, society, uh, but that this, this kind of positive attribute of Indigenous life could be corrupted by power relations and could, could result in, you know, some people um, exerting dominance and, and um, you know, others missing out on, on money. This was part of the justification of the basics card, part of the justification of those early, you know, more Indigenous trial sites of the cashless debit card. Um, I think the fact is that in either case, 
um, this just cannot be prevented. It's, it's a cultural principle um, that to, to kind of pull resources and to share and very consistently people have found ways to do that in, in, in both cases. Uh, so, you know, I guess some anthropologists write about this, um, you know, this the determination to keep on living life according to the principles and values that are important to people uh, and people do find ways to do that. So another person has asked whether that was something that participants had encountered in the inability to transfer um, to family members that they were supporting or that or family members that were relying on the cashless card holder. So how much did you come across that? Yeah, I mean, people certainly can, yeah, people complain to me that it can be a way that um, card holders might kind of try and evade their their obligations to contribute or to give to the running of households, they could shrug and say, got no cash, um, you know, and are unable to kind of, you know, in a sort of very fluid and everyday way, contribute funds to the running of, of, of households and to support others. Um, but I do think it was, a, you know, quite a strong theme of local life that people were able to innovate and find new ways to do that either through um, logging on and transferring some funds across, through um, people kind of going shopping together, sharing cards. Um, yeah, people, people do find ways to sort of move money and move goods uh, around and, and to continue to share. Mm -hmm. And uh, just one last question before we wrap up from, from the audience is um, whether you think that some of the tangible um, feelings and, and sort of impacts that especially Indigenous communities have felt could have been slightly mitigated or whether those feelings might be different if they had been sufficiently consulted and their voice better reflected. So that goes to the methodology question again and consultation. Sure. Uh, yeah, the consultation question is really complex because uh, I think what's happened as part of these uh, consultation processes is that you know, there are these very kind of uh, strong Indigenous community controlled organisations in places like this, they assume the role of representative body, um, they assume, you, you know, that they are sort of, that they have a seat at the table, I mean, the, those research participants that say this is a different time, this is a time with rights, are, are correct, and, and part of what's happened since the 1970s in Australia is a kind of institutionalization of Indigenous voices and Indigenous perspectives. Uh, but at the same time, I guess, I've worked with people who feel that, that that provides a way that governments can talk with Aboriginal people, uh, but they're talking with people who are not the people who are going to end up actually having a card in their wallet. So they're talking to the Aboriginal people who are, you know, very committed, community-minded uh, mm -hmm. people working within grassroots organisations, but they are the people who are, you know, they're, they're very gainfully employed in those organisations and uh, they're working at, at a kind of, you know, community level um, and they uh, are kind of, they have a voice and and then this creates this whole other kind of category of people who are more marginalized uh who feel that they are being spoken for um and spoken about and and that they don't have a voice and but that the card will come to affect them um more than those others mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm afraid we uh, we have to wrap up the conversation because we are uh, over the hour already. Uh, but I just wanted to thank you, Eve, for um, for enlightening us today. Uh, I thought it was a very interesting question and a real richness to the uh, to the Q and A as well. I'm only sorry that we didn't have more uh, uh, more time to answer answer more questions. I think one of the takeaways from me uh, from this conversation is not just sort of the inherent relevance of the CDC trials, but also the similarities between the projects uh, here in Australia and uh, and elsewhere. I mean, we pointed out, for instance, the uh, similarities 
uh, with some of the developments in South Africa, uh, for instance, and I'm sure the same applies to uh, what's happening uh, elsewhere. One of the other things that we didn't address in that regard is the role that Visa and also MasterCard have played in sort of promoting this idea of cashless uh, debit cards for a range of uh, reasons beyond the realm of just welfare uh, uh, policy, quite uh, quite obviously. Uh, but we'll have to reserve that for uh, for next uh, conversation. Um, just to reiterate uh, to the audience members that this conversation has been recorded and uh, and so will soon be uh, uploaded uploaded on the on the center's um, uh, YouTube channel and on our webpage, where we'll write a, a summary blog of this conversation and and post the video uh, along with some background materials, uh, including the writing of uh, of Eve on these uh, on these issues. Um, and then uh, finally to note that we'll continue this series in the in the new year where we'll hope to focus uh, among other um, um, case studies on digital government experimentation in India in China and in uh, South Africa among uh, a few other places uh, thanks again to our audience members and thank again, thanks again to you uh, Eve for uh, for joining us today my pleasure thank you so much <laughs>